Welcome to On The Whistle. We're back with another AFCON Daily Digest preview pod. This one is all about Group C. Some call it the Group of Death, with Morocco lining up with Ghana, Comoros, and Gabon. If you agree, disagree with that statement, or just want to let us know your thoughts, hit us up. OTW underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram, and On The Whistle podcast on Facebook. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and also on YouTube. To kick things off, I spoke to journalist Amin El Amri and asked him whether Morocco can bring their excellent form over the last year into the tournament. Well, uh, there are a lot of elements in there. Um, first of all, uh, Morocco played all of his uh, World Cup qualifiers at home uh, because either uh, the pitches weren't validated by FIFA and CAF or either in Guinea, for example, they went there, they were prepared to play. And the, 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 the day, the, same, the very same day of the game, there was a coup d'etat. So, mm-hmm. uh, and they were obligated to, to go back. So uh, there are a lot of elements. Uh, first of all, playing at home, the six games of the World Cup qualifiers uh, made a huge impact on, on the team, uh, playing at ease, playing at home, uh, even without fans, but uh, it was a good preparation for, for the AFCON. Uh, the second part is uh, since Bahid Halilovic took over in August 2019, there has been this, um, this huge um, change at the team. I mean, the generation of uh, Benatia, Belhanda, Bosofa, Ahmadi, etc. Uh, got away and uh, there's a new, uh, a new generation in town and, uh, and the likes of, uh, for example, Imran Duza, who plays for for the Hornets, for uh, for uh, uh, and uh, Mazina, his uh, his, uh, his his companion there. Uh, there's also uh, uh, Elias Shai from Queens Park Rangers, uh, Ayman Balkok from Eintracht Frankfurt, and uh, there are a lot, a lot of new, new players, and they're all, I think, motivated to show uh, the coach. Uh, how good they are and uh, how much they earn their place uh, in this team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was looking looking back at the last AFCON, I think there was only four players in the starting lineup of the last game of the AFCON who have even been selected for, for this one. So it's amazing that you've kept that kind of form coming into this whilst also uh, kind of seeing all those changes. Um, in terms of the team selection, obviously the biggest news for, for people watching Morocco is, is the fact that Hakim Ziyech and, uh, and Nusser Mazraoui have both been left out. Can you, can you give us a bit of an insight as to why that's happened and how, the, how Moroccan fans feel about that? Well, at first, uh, it, it all started in, uh, in March uh, 2021. Uh, the two players got called up. Uh, there was this huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this huge thing, the talking about coronavirus and the clubs that uh, wouldn't let players go, et cetera, for, for FIFA window. So um, Hakim Ziyech got in here a bit late, uh, Mazraoui also three or four days late, and that didn't ring a good bell in the, in the ear of uh, Vahid Halilodzic who's always been known for discipline and stuff. And, you know, he's a, he's a, very, uh, he's a very disciplined, uh, centered guy, uh, if you can say so. Mm-hmm. So I, I think it started from there. Uh, there was a game in Mauritania where the, the pitch was horrible and uh, the conditions weren't optimal. So uh, players started to think, yeah, maybe if I go hard there, uh, I might be injured or something. And, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Chelsea at the time, for example, for Hakim Ziyech was playing the uh, quarterfinals of the Champions League. So there's this, all this pressure around the players uh, that they must be careful. They have to go back to their clubs safe, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I think that that, uh, that speech didn't uh, suit uh, Vahid Halilovic who wants everybody to be 100% uh, with the team, with the national team. And afterwards, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, he said, they said, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there wasn't really uh, 
a real communication about what happened and honest communication. I think that's, uh, that's from the Federation part. And I think that's a huge fault because uh, when you leave people out of what's happening inside the national team, I'm not talking about uh, the changing rooms and stuff. There are sacred secrets and et cetera, but uh, you have to take an official statement. You have to take action. If the player is indisciplined, so you have to take action. You know, you're gonna be banned for three, four games. Mm -hmm. You have to say sorry in front of everybody and stuff. Uh, I don't know, but there has to be a, a, a modus operandi for players to go back to the team or to go out. And uh, leaving that like that, uh, it made uh, Zahid Halilovic look like the bad man, you know? Mm. He was always going, uh, the presses uh, saying that those, those guys are not disciplined, they're not 100% behind the team, etc. Whereas uh, and the young players, they are clever, you know, unless they're the, they don't communicate forefront, you know? They, they go on the... Uh, on social media, they post an, an emoji there and uh, a tweet, a uh, deep uh, quote, etc. Uh, somewhere else. So mm -hmm. it, it's not really direct communication. And uh, that, uh, not now, but in, in a couple of months, and if it happened with some other players, uh, it will be really, really bad for the national team's image. Mm. Yeah, and, and it kind of from a Moroccan standpoint, do you think most fans are kind of are they kind of happy that that these guys have been left out because of the way they behaved, or is there a sense that actually, you know, these are two of our biggest stars, and you know, Velahizovic has kind of treated them really badly, um, and so is there any ill will from the fans to the coach, um, or are they kind of behind him in terms of we need to, you know, keep the discipline, keep kick the players out who aren't committed. There are there always uh, two parts of, of the public in Morocco, you know? Mm -hmm. The part that uh, stands with the players and the part that stands with the coach. It, it happened with Renard and Ziyech. It happened with Zaki and other, you know, players and, and, and coaches in the past. What happened with, with Vahid is the majority of people, of fans, were against him when he took Hakim Ziyech and Nozir Mazraoui out of the list. Mm -hmm. which is normal because these players are talented. Yeah. We used to see them. Uh, uh, Hakim Ziyech played and Mazraoui played the semifinals of the Champions League two years ago. But there's always this part that says, uh, okay, Hakim Ziyech is a very talented player, but what did he actually do with the national team? He played the World Cup and an AFCON, and he didn't perform in both of them, in neither mm -hmm. of them. Uh, no goals, no assists in, in, in two tournaments. So people would say, uh, okay, Hakim Ziyech is a very talented player, but he's not, uh, he's not a national team player. But the, on the other part, Hakim Ziyech starts on the qualifiers, on the other games are, you know, skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he's uh, he's one, of the, one of the most successful scorers in this team, actually. And... Uh, Mosey Mazraoui also is a very versatile player. He can play in, in three or four positions on the pitch. So mm -hmm. uh, people would say, come on, Vahid Lalilotic, make an effort and try to, you know, to make peace with, with those players because we need them. We don't certainly need them now for the AFCON, but we will need them in March when uh, comes uh, the playoff to the World Cup. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, there, there has been a large part who was against Vahid Hadi Lodzic at the first, especially when the team was, wasn't performing, uh, the football wasn't great, uh, let's be honest. But with the results and the time and uh, perseverance of Vahid Hadi Lodzic of saying, okay, these guys are not coming. Mm -hmm. uh, some people started to say, okay, maybe we can, uh, we ought to take this uh, uh, this discipline road, this discipline, uh, you know, uh, yeah. trajectory, mm -hmm. and it, it might just work. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And looking at the at the team, the other thing that stood out to me was the inclusion of Yusuf El Nasiri, who's obviously been one of Morocco's best performers, you know, and at club level has been incredible for him for Sevilla, but he's obviously been injured for most of this season. 
Um, do you think that he's going to be fit enough for the tournament? And if he's not, who who will step in for him? I know Ryan May has has done it in the past, but who do you think will start up top and and kind of be the goal scorer for Morocco? I don't think in the series we we'll, we we'll start the first game. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, he's he's a he's um he's a large part of this project because he's young, he's not that talented, but he's talented in front of the goal. Mm -hmm. So it makes a huge difference. We haven't had a really great striker since I think Marwan Shemath, with with all the respect to Yusuf Arabi to all the others who who passed on. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think we had a, a world-class finisher since Marwan Shemak. So uh, Yusuf Nsayri is a big, big prospect and a big project for maybe the four or five years coming in the national team. But he had that bad injury, the thigh. Uh, it's, it's hard because uh, the, recovery, uh, the, the recovery is harder than, than the injury itself. So... Sevilla uh, were talking about three months and stuff, you know, but I think that was for propaganda purposes because they always want their players to stay there, mm -hmm. especially in January when yeah. you have uh, the cup, the, the, the Liga, mm -hmm. the stuff, you know, when you have to have all your players fit. But that's um, that's a part of a, a greater uh, debate. But uh, I think if Yusuf Nsayri isn't fit to start the first the first game of the first two games, Vahid would uh, would uh, apply what he has done in the last three games uh, in the national three or four games. He played with uh, two up front, composed of uh, Ryan May and Ayub Kabi, instead of a three up front with a with a, a very frank, frank uh, striker, mm -hmm. so uh, it's this mixity, and and this is uh, this what makes this team, uh, I think, one of the outsiders for this tournament, is that the variety of the tactical teams. So I think uh, if Nseri isn't fit, uh, he would be my personal first choice. Mm -hmm. So if he's not fit, I think Vahid would might, you know, change change a little bit the tactical positions to put Ryan May, both Ryan May and uh, Ayubu Kabi up front. Okay. And and last question is how do you think Morocco are going to be able to do it one better than they did in 2004 and, and actually get that that first AFCON win in, in so many years? Um, and if so, what do they need to do to kind of compete with Algeria and, and Senegal and these other huge, huge teams? Well, um, uh, I'll be frank with you. I, I don't see them uh, win this tournament mm -hmm. uh, unless there's a big surprise. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they need humility. That was hap that what happened in the, that's what happened in 2004. Nobody put a dime on this on that team. Mm -hmm. And uh, the motivation were, was like uh, with the outsiders, nobody's, you know, betting on us. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, you know, just think game by game and, and go ahead. And uh, the difference is now uh, everybody's waiting for Morocco, even if it's the worst team in the last two decades. Uh, I'm not talking about this team, yeah. but for example, if it's if it's the worst team ever in Morocco, uh, everybody would, you know, be waiting for it because mm. uh, the talents and the potential are there. So the mix with a good coach and minimal conditions would be very little for other for other selections. Mm -hmm. For example, when I see um, when I see Senegal's list, I mean, they're, they're the most talented. Mm -hmm. Without yeah. a doubt, this is the best. I, I think this is the best 23 men squad I've seen in years in mm -hmm. African football. Yeah, I mean, it's complete. It's complete. You have every position with two players on it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is a great team. But on the paper, yeah, we don't know what happened on the pitch. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes Aliou Sisi back home. You see this, all this pressure around them. Uh, 
it, uh, it's the same thing for Algeria, which is a more composed team mm -hmm. with many good, good players and two or three big stars like uh, Mahrez or Bilaili. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, this is uh, this is again the, the the football in Africa. <laughs> you you have to wait for the surprise. It never happens when you got all the odds with you. Mm -hmm. uh, it happened to Zambia in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it happened to Cote d'Ivoire in 2015 when they had the less talented team, uh -huh. they won the AFCON, you know? And uh, for Morocco, I think uh, the discipline and, uh, and the, the, the players being behind Fahid Harirosic would be a key element. If this happens, and players uh, stand with Vahid Halilovic, uh, and they go as they go as planned with the discipline and, and, and all the stuff. I think they they have a chance, but I don't think, to be honest, I don't think they have a chance to win the tournament. And if it happens, it go, it's going to be a huge surprise. From one African giant to another, to talk about Ghana, I spoke to Gary L. Smith and needed to know what this AFCON means to a Ghanaian side in transition. Wow, that's a good one. Uh, without being too much of an exaggerated opinion, but very important because Ghana is, is at a crossroads, if I can put it that way. It's only 10, 11 years ago now that Ghana wowed the world at the World Cup in 2010. And um, after that, got to the last end of the 2012 African Cup of Nations, 2013, 2015, 2017 AFCON. And it was part of a series of at least eight AFCONs where Ghana got to at least the quarterfinals. That is a stupendous run for any competition. Mother luck did not shine on Ghana because, I mean, by the odds of probabilities, you know, if you get into the last four of eight, six competitions, at least you should win one, you know, but hey, that's how it is. And so that's natural cycle. You know, they say football works in cycles. And once you get to the end of a cycle like that and you don't win anything, or there's nothing to show for it, obviously there's gonna be a decline of sorts. And so for me, it's not that much of, it's not, I'm not too alarmed because I just feel like it's a cycle, but how you manage that cycle is important because if you go, if you drop down too deep, you might have a mighty struggle coming up. Yeah, you might decline a bit, a few notches down, and then you can rebound up again and, and continue. And that is what most Ghanaian fans are hoping is gonna happen. And that is where this AFCON comes in that with a new blood of players that are coming in, with a new coach that is in, with a federation that seems to probably be seeing what the problems are, Ghana can come out of that rut quickly. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think looking at, at the new appointment, it's, it's almost a sense of that trying to bring back that old success. Obviously, Milan Rejavec, who's just been, been appointed a couple months ago, is, was the one who took you to that amazing quarterfinal in, in 2010. Um, how do you feel about that appointment, especially coming just just a kind of couple months before the AFCON? You know, CK O'Connor was was sacked just a couple months ago after a rather disappointing uh, World Cup qualifiers uh, campaign, which which you've pulled through, obviously. Um, but how do you feel about that appointment, bringing him back back to the country? This is probably the first time I've said this anyway. <laughs> um, that his appointment filled me with. I didn't type it on say it anywhere on Twitter or anywhere because you know you know how second comings can be and sometimes you are at risk of making a nostalgic appointment when you should make a more pragmatic one but in this case I felt hope because it was yes nostalgic but it was pragmatic too why do I say that defense wins championships attacks or the striking force will win you games. If there's anyone who knows how to defend and to grind out results, it was Milovan. And so when you have a poor team or a team that is not as exciting as a 2010 one, the first thing you want to do is not to concede goals, 
right? And this is probably the best guy we've had in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Who knows how to do that? Yes, admittedly, since he left Ghana, he's not done much. But in terms of, you know, like if you have a Venn diagram, you want somebody who is not too expensive for you so that you can afford him, mm-hmm. but not too cheap also because, you know, cheap things can be expensive in the long run. Mm-hmm. And somebody who has the institutional knowledge of your football association or your country mm. and somebody who also knows the terrain knows your players and knows what is at stake so he wasn't the probably that he definitely was not Ghana's first choice absolutely not mm. you know but for me if you ticked all the boxes he ticked as many boxes as possible and that's why i was happy with his appointment crucially crucially his appointment rejuvenated a nation that had probably lost faith in, in the coaching staff that we had at the time. Mm-hmm. And he's ridden on that wave. And, 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 you know, I mean, we've seen what he's done so far. It's not been perfect, but he's got the results that he needs mm, to. Got to, Ghana to. Got in Ghana to the playoffs. Mm. And, and he was thro- thrown in in such a difficult situation as well. You know, there was no, no time to build anything. He had to get those results immediately against Ethiopia and South Africa. Um, and, and he did that even if it was tight. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you, you were talking about how Ghana kind of is, has kind of come to the end of the cycle. When, when I look at the squad now, it, it really feels like that. You know, I think when I've looked at some of the, 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 the squads they've put out recently, there still feels like there's quite a strong reliance on, on say, the IU brothers who, you know, look like they're probably past their peak and kind of represent perhaps the, the last kind of vestiges of that old kind of really, really strong Ghanaian team that dominated for so long. But then when I also look at some of the players coming through, you know, I see Kamaldin Suleimana, Mohamed Kuduz, you know, even Abdul Isahaku, it might be a bit too early for him and Felix Afenajian, but these are really, really exciting players that have kind of the potential to go as far as some of these players that that came through in, in the early 2010s. D- does this tournament feel like it's almost, you know, too, too late or too early for Ghana to kind of be, be favorites for it? Yes, it is too early. Mm-hmm. And definitely, I mean, I would not, any honest person would not put Ghana as favorite. And one of the few times that probably the FIFA and the CAF rankings are absolutely spot on because Ghana is definitely not a top five African football nation at the top level. And definitely, in my opinion, not top eight. Mm. So if you see anything with Ghana in the top 10 and Ghana is ninth or 10th, 11th, that should be just about right. because. The Ghana team is not bad, 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 bad. I mean, on a good day, they are going to beat most teams. But then when they come against the, the usual suspects of, of, of the moment, Algeria, Senegal, uh, Morocco, uh, maybe Nigeria, not me, yeah, you know, Cameroon, they are mm-hmm. going to struggle. Mm-hmm. So, so that's it. But that is where coaching comes in, I mm-hmm. argue. That the team on its own, if you put them out there, they are not gelled enough. They've not played enough games. They've not understood what identity they have enough to break teams, superior teams down on their own. But having somebody in the dugout who can direct them Mm -hmm. will be the difference or will be the reason probably why Ghana could do better than the last AFCON and Mm -hmm. probably get past the round of 16 into the quarterfinals. For me, coaching is such a big big, big game changer in this AFCON that Ghana is going into. Mm. Yeah, and and particularly so because, you know, so few teams have had proper build-ups to it because of COVID, you know, so many teams, you know, yeah. even, even Ghana's World Cup qualifiers, you know, you went to Africa without half your team, you know, like it, you, there's so little time to prepare. There's so little kind of space to get things right. Um, do, what is the mood in, in Ghana for the tournament? I mean, a lot of the, I see a lot of parallels between this team and say, the England team at the 2018 World Cup where you have some good players, but there's so little expectation because it's been quite low the last couple of years. Do you think that there is that low expectation or do you feel like that Ghanaians still see themselves as we need to be getting semifinals, finals, you know, we need to be up there. You know, how do you think the the mood of of the country is right now going into it? The reality check came in 2018. If it didn't hit in 2018, it definitely hit in 2019 Mm -hmm. because it was clear what Ghana's level was, you know, at the time. And Ghana has struggled through games. I mean, the production line of players, 
speaks for itself. Where are the goals coming on? Definitely not from the striking department. Jordan has not scored as at the time of recording this podcast for what club in country since November last year. Mm. That is not what you want your top striker <laughs> to be doing. Right? And I mean, it's it's to such an extent that people are saying that if a Samoajan should hit the gym mm. for one whole month, he would walk ready. into this guy. <laughs> No, and, and 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 it's yes. No, if it's he hits the far. gym, yeah. If he hits the gym on this day before a month, we are recording this. You mm-hmm. know, a month before the last one. If Jan hits the gym and gets in shape in time, he's mm-hmm. got the mental acuity. He would he would not be as fast, but definitely, if you put the ball in the box for him two times out of four, he's going to score two. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So. Mm-hmm. That is, that is the sense to which, but of course, the goals are coming from midfield, which gives you a sense of a throwback to 2006, 2010, when a lot of Ghana's goals were coming from Steven Apia, Michael Essien, mm-hmm. um, Lai Kingston, and the midfielders that Ghana had, Sule Muntari, you know. So that is it's a throwback to that era. Very interesting, though, interestingly, though, for the first time in a while, the best part of Ghana's team Maybe the defense, which is not something you hear Ghana teams saying mm. a lot, yeah. you know. So that may be the crucial thing. If they're able to get their head screwed on at the back mm. and not concede goals and work out a way to use some of the players you've mentioned who are very, very fast, mm-hmm. you know, then that may be a danger. But then again, another thing will be to be successful at an AFCON these days with teams being so technical you need probably two or three different ways of playing. So you don't want to be playing only speedily down the wings. Mm-hmm. You want to be able to fashion out something through the middle, mm-hmm. set pieces, you know, which is hopefully something they can, they can work on. Yeah. yeah. So it's all up in the air. And which is why, like you say correctly, the expectations are so super low here in Ghana. Mm. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned that, that at the moment, you know, expectations are low because Ghana is at a, bit, a pretty, pretty low ebb in terms of performance, particularly compared to kind of the big, big African sides at the moment. So going into this tournament as, as both a journalist and a fan, what are your kind of hopes and expectations from the tournament itself? Where would be a kind of a successful, a successful kind of performance for you? Huh. A lot of Ghanaians, it's much like Liverpool um, three years ago. If you ask Liverpool fans if they really, after they won the Champions League, if they really wanted another Champions League trophy or they wanted the Premier League, and they would have mm. said, ah, we want the Premier League because it had been yeah. 30 years. Ghana hasn't won the Afghan since 1982. So many Ghanaians will pick an Afghan trophy quickly, you know, rather than a good World Cup performance. Mm. But for legacy reasons and for building into the future, I would actually put, I would actually say, let's whatever level Ghana got to at the end of the AFCON in Cameroon, Ghana should leave the AFCON with one. That should maybe our first thing. A set starting 11 that even a 15-year-old in Ghana can name. Mm. You know, that thing, when you have a team that even a 15-year-old can name the starting 11 of, then you are going somewhere. Yeah. Because as of now, if you ask randomly six Ghanaian football fans who, who don't follow the team religiously, hey, what's your Ghana ideal Ghana starting 11? Mm. They're probably yeah. going to give you different answers, which is always not a good sign. So yeah. mine will be, let's finish the AFCON with an undisputed starting 11 that we all know and believe. Then we can get behind them and say that, all right, we are playing in this style. Secondly, um, apart from that, we are playing in two different or three different ways. We, when, we, when we have the starting 11, then we can then say, let's play in three different ways. We can win games in three different fashions, mm-hmm. going through the middle on the side so that we are not relying on this one player or that player because all the teams that are going to come through the AFCON will know that obviously these are the guys, if you mark them out of the game, Ghana is finished. And you don't, you don't want that at any yeah. point in time. Thirdly, what I'll also be looking out for, actually, I'm not looking out for the team to get in the semifinals or anything. That's a bonus. Mm. I want a sense of patriotism from the team. 
Okay. That is what I'm looking for. Mm. Players who understand what it means to wear the jersey. We had that between 2006 and 2010. And forget what anybody says. That's important. In this age where almost all African countries who are successful are looking forward to naturalizing players from elsewhere who really don't understand what it means mm. for, you know, Egypt are having a, hey, Algeria, sorry, Algeria are having that, that problem. Um, Nigeria are having that problem. Very good players, but they don't understand what it means to wear the shirt. Mm. And that's a, a challenge for them. So these are the three things I'd want to pick from Ghana, from the AFCON. Anything else is a bonus for me. Mm. Morocco and Ghana are joined by one of only two deputants at the tournament, the Comoros. To hear about the Silakan's chances in Cameroon, I spoke to Boina Husamdin, editor of Comoros 269, who told me just how much qualification to their first tournament meant to the tiny island nation. Uh, it was a proudly moment. See, you know, it's a proudly moment. You, you, you say it to he, he had, we have um, recognized in FIFA since uh, 2005. Uh, uh, we have uh, now um, uh, 50 years, 50 years uh, that we play international football uh, and um, make it in 50 years. It was, uncle, uh, it was amazing. It was uh, uh, a, a thing that we not believe uh, many time, uh, many years before. So it was, a, a, a proudly moment and a, a moment of uh, uh, joy and um, uh, and proud, yes, and proud. I mean, I, I have one of my friends in Comores, I remember him sending me videos of the streets, um, people right. going crazy <laughs> and in Moroni and yes. celebrating, you know. Yes, in Moroni and, and the other, the, the other city, they always live the same, the same scene, the same scene in uh, every Comorian um, uh, celebrates it, celebrates it uh, uh, because the, 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 the football, that is the one thing that uh, every Comorian, uh, and the, 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 there is the, same, the, the, the one thing that unites all Comorian. We have uh, many things in politics, we have many, uh, we, we, we are in a, pro, um, a, 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 a we are a country that we not develop. We, have, we are a, a poor country. So, uh, also, so a football, a success in football is something something better. So, uh, uh, so every Comorian is uh, was proudly that the Selakans make it for the first time in 50 years. There is uh, there was a uh, amazing amazing. Yeah, I mean, in incredible. I mean, I, I, I want to ask you, you know, the team is so young and, you know, the, the, has so little experience. How has the team come so far, you know, in the last five, six years? What, what has been that process in making the team so, so strong to qualify? The, the one thing the, is the prof professional. professional uh, so we have the, the, the aim to professionalize the team the, because of our... Uh, before we have a team that a player plays in uh, in the local scene, and the player that plays in the uh, lowly level uh, in Europe, in France, uh, in France, uh, and the aim in 2014 is to professionalize the the team. Uh, we have uh, in 2014 a player that, uh, like uh, uh, El Fardo Ben Mohamed like for the Bashiru, like uh, Shakir Aradir and Kasim Abdallah. They is the player who played in a level, uh, acceptable level uh, in this uh, in, 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 in this year. Then uh, also uh, uh, progressively, progressively, year by year, uh, step by step, we professionalize avec, with the player that we play in uh, League 1, League 2, uh, a, a professional league in uh, Greece, and now we have, uh, for example, El Fardo Ben Mohamed, who play uh, Champions League, we play Europa League with the Red Star uh, uh, of Belgrade. We have a player like uh, Faisal Soleimani, who play in Belgium uh, in Fast League, and other many players who play, who play also in uh, the Netherlands. We have Sid Bakari, uh, for example. We have uh, 
we have uh, Yassin Burhan and other players that were professional uh, progressively in the eighth year we have uh, uh, the project of Amir Abdu and there is the clay the 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 the, 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 the clay of uh, success of the of the group mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean that's amazing that progress you've made in that in that short amount of time and if I'm not wrong, so many of those guys are, you know, they're they're born in France. They're guys who've come from the Comorian yeah, diaspora, diaspora, particularly from from Marseille. You know, how, how important have they been, you know, in, in terms of building that professionalization? Because obviously, you know, it's hard to have an established professional league in the Comores, you know, I, many different islands and, you know, major cities are in different islands. You know, how important has it been to, to you know, use the, the di diaspora? Yeah, it's it's the, the the thing that we 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 think uh, first. Uh, uh, we are say that so we have not a professional league uh, uh, in Comoros, but we have a diaspora that uh, the son of uh, our father, our uncle, our mm -hmm. mother play in a level that will be uh, important for for us. Uh, so we we think that we have to 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 to, to talk uh to talk with uh, this player to talk with this diaspora and uh, tell them that we can do better we can do uh, uh, a thing that will be important for for Comoros if we are united if we are uh, we believe and our and our um, uh, our aims in the uh, uh, in the uh, and after uh, step by step, by like uh, I said, step by step, we have um, uh, talked with uh, some players, some mm -hmm. uh, agent, football agent, and some person that uh, some person in the, the diaspora that were that they, they are influent, they are influent and can uh, talk about uh, about with. Uh, uh, a player in the and uh, and after he will come with the national team, there is the process. We, there was a process to convert, to convert a player which play, for, for example, for, for in, in league and in league two, uh, and tell the, him that uh, we can make something great with the, the national team of uh, of, of Comoros. And there is the the same the same way we use also first for the for the for the coach I mean, Abdu, that mm -hmm. uh, he is born in Moroni but uh, he he grew in France uh, child child in the childhood mm -hmm. Donc he grew in the diaspora and uh, there is something donc, uh, like the he 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 believe himself and he he try to to make it in practice mm -hmm. I mean I, I just want to talk about Amir Abdu you know he's you you said you know 2014 is when they started professionalizing that's when he he joined and became the head coach how important has he been in building this this team now he's the the man the man of the success <laughs> mm -hmm. he's the man of the success because uh first he convert uh, uh many players uh, good players who, who play for professionally he professionalized the uh, the team he Try to to give a a, a sense a a, a a a level in the group. He try also to 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 give the team a uh, like uh, what do 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 you say that in English a a a play in in sense of play mm, like a, a philosophy a style well, like a philosophy but mm -hmm. like, like, like what? A, a philosophy. He tried to, to introduce a philosophy in the in the team, and that is the clay, the the key that we use a, a a group, a team that he play he play uh, together since eight years, and he have not a have not a success uh, in the debut. We debut with um, some defeat, some uh, draw. Some difficult, but he tried to make it uh, that we have gained a experience, a experience, and he tried to make it a, a success. Our defeat, our draw, our victory. He 
there is, it was a, a lesson, a lesson for us, and he make it an experience, a very good experience that we brought, we, we bring uh, all of the group, all the player to be performant, to be competitive, to be a, a team that we can, uh, uh, we, 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 that we, we are able now to, to face a team and say that we can uh, win a game uh, against a, a team that's like uh, Cameroon, like uh, uh, Morocco, like uh, Egypt. And there is the philosophy that Amir Abdu try to, to impulse, to, to give uh, uh, for, for the team of, of, of Silaka. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, for me as, as a Kenyan, it was very painful to watch watch how well the, the Comores played when you played us, you know, off the park, both home home and away in the qualifiers and knocked us out uh, when you qualified. But, you know, the, you're clearly playing some really good football. Um, I, I just want to, you know, look at the at the squad now. You know, most people watching the Africa Cup of Nations, they won't be super familiar with the Comores team. Um, can you just tell us, you know, who who are the big players in this team? Who are the guys who are going to make it happen uh, if if Comores are to, to get any wins in their group? The, the, there is three players. Uh, the one is uh, the biggest, the superstar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the, we have not superstar, but we have a player that uh, they give all of them. But this, the first player is uh, El Fardo Ben Mohamed that play in the Red Star in uh, in Serbia, is a is the best striker of uh, of the team. He have now uh, fifty goals uh, in the uh, in the national team, and he is a player that we that if he is in the in the pitch, we are we are we are sure that we can make something in the in, in the game. So he's a play player, uh, a clay a clay player that we can uh, say that he played and we are sure that the, the game will be different. He, if he is um, absent, we are not uh, uh, comfortable <laughs> with the game. <laughs> like, like this. Uh -huh. He is a, a, key, a key player for, for us. The other player is uh, uh, Isufu Shangama. He's a midfielder. He played uh, with uh, Anavan Genga in France. Uh, he played uh, also uh, for Grenoble a uh, year before. Uh, it's a player that a player that he played uh, the second level of, of France many years, many years uh, now. And the particular of uh, Yusuf Shangama is a midfielder, but he scored more goals. If <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 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 like say it, it's a player that we can defend. He can uh, play everywhere in the in, 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 in the midfielder uh, as as a midfielder, but also give an assist, make a goal, uh, make a goal and assist also the striker uh, like Ben uh, El Fado ben, uh, ben Mohamed. We have also another player, clay player, uh, Faiz Selemani, who play in uh, in Belgium in uh, uh, Courtre. Uh, in English, I don't know what we say in uh, yeah, English. Maybe Kortik or something. I'm but, not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah. not sure how we pronounce it in English yeah. either. Kortik, <laughs> Kortik. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, 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 maybe like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the particularly of uh, Faisalemani, he he make uh, he, he score goal, but also he is uh, we he have a particular that he is uh, have a. Um, what, what, what do you say? He have a the particularity to dribble, uh, yeah, uh, don't dribble. know how, how well, to dribble, and uh, he is fast. Mm -hmm. can, he can he can he can play fast, very fast in uh, in, in the game, and it's, it's a player that uh, we can play a uh, in our offensive in our offensive. Uh, uh, strategy in, in, in the pitch, he can very, um, he can play very fast and make like uh, uh, the, the the team will be will be able to to project in the in in, in the game. So they also the three player, uh, if we have uh, all of them in the in the game, uh, 
we have a, a solid, a very strong team uh, uh, in, in, in the pitch. Mm -hmm. We have another, we have another play, but the three that I uh, I say it, it's a very important uh, in the team. Mm -hmm. well, 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 for sure, and come, come, you know, look, look out for these guys as as they perform. One last question, I, I just want to say, what, what, for the the Comorian team, what is the the goal of this tournament? You know, you're in a very, very difficult group. Um, you know, with Gabon, Ghana, Morocco. You know, what what would be considered a successful tournament for for the Comoros? Uh, to to make the 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 stage of uh, sixteen. Mm -hmm. We, we believe, we believe we have a, a group that is not, uh, uh, it's not easy. We have the Morocco, we have the Ghana, we have Gabon, uh, a very strong team in Africa. But we, we believe that we have a, something to, to say. We have uh, some uh, football to, to, to show for, for, for the continent. Um, why we believe that this? Uh, because we have a team that, uh, the the k the k of the team is the collectivity we play collective so collectively collectively we have not star we have we are not a team that we 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 say that i uh, have a we have a, a star like uh obama young like mm -hmm. ashraf hakimi like uh, uh andre ayu we have no this player our our strength is the collective play collectively uh, we have an experience but uh, because we have we, we know we know the we know the the we we know the success and we know also that we can uh, we can lose we know the loss mm -hmm. as the 18 as the 80 eight year that we we try to qualify we have lost and we know that mm -hmm. we know how to lose mm -hmm. we know how to win Mm -hmm. there's, there's there's other team they know to win they 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 know they don't know how are the the to to lose to to not success mm -hmm. we know that don't we we believe that our experience each year of experience each year that all the player play together together it's important because you can see the other the other the other team like morocco like ghana like gabon uh, in each year, they change. They change many players in the mm -hmm. many players. But no, but us, we have uh, the same player, but, but all not all, but the the majority of the player play together in each year. They know they know each other. Mm -hmm. They uh, they can they can uh, bring something uh, news in the Fcon. We have uh, some talented player that you can also make the difference. And we believe that we can uh, we can uh, qualify for the the second stage. Uh, probably we don't we don't know that the future will uh, will reserve us. But the very uh, a, a a good tournament for, for us is to 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 qualify for the second the second stage. In order to achieve that dream of reaching the next round, the Comores will have to go through a gap on side who've struggled of late. I will note that this podcast was recorded before Pierre Amick Aubameyang tested positive for COVID-19, meaning that our guest John Fitzgerald was perhaps more excited about the forward than he may be now. But the fans are very, uh, very, uh, very happy because uh, we can have our captain with uh, we first for the African Cup of Russia because we know that, that uh, many clubs in Europe are are very uh, sad because they, they they don't want to to give our player our our African player for the competitions. Now Pierre Ricos Bayern joined the team uh, two weeks ago and the the work uh, it works a lot now because we know that this is probably his last tournament for Africa Cup of Nations and we know that is he has um, there is many 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 changes in his in his um, in his um, important because that we know that Pierre in the past Pierre Marie was very uh, uh, there is many 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 problems with the federation and now. 
for uh, for this tournament. We know that uh, Pierre Marek will be uh, will be the star, and uh, will be um, um, our um, our captain and our top uh, our top scorer, top goal scorer. And we we hope that with the national team, with the partners Lemina and the others like David Wanga, they will be at the top during the, the competition, the tournament in, uh, in the Cameroon. And we hope that it will be for us, our, um, our top scholar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, when I look at the team, you know, some of the players, it's, you have a, a good mixture of some young players, but you have some very, very experienced players, you know, the likes of Abameyang, Bikir Munga, Lloyd Palu, and, you know, players who've been there for a long time. Is there a sense that this is kind of their last chance you know, to, to do something at the Africa Cup of Nations because, you know, a big core of the team is, is getting quite old now. Yeah, exactly, because um, since 2010, we have uh, two players now who, who, who have played um, until until now. Pierre Rick Aubameyang, Vinny Kuali Manga, this is their third tournament. And, and they are main experience, and Coco, Palu, um, and all those players. And now we have the young players like Eric and Amira. We have um, uh, all the other players like uh, Jim Levina. Uh, he will play this uh, with uh, his first tournament in Cameroon. And, and this is for us a great mixture for the team. And that's why we are. Um, we make many, many hope for for this tournament in the Cameroon because you nobody know, Cameroon in 2016 they are win won the cup here in Libreville during the final against uh, the Gypsyland. And now this is for us another occasion for the national team with the whole player as uh, Obanian or you know Bruno Palavanga and the uh, and the older players, the young players, Eric and Amela, who play for Brighton. This is for us. Uh, another occasion to 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 win the cup in uh, in Cameroon. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I wanted to talk about briefly about the the coach Patrice Nevu. You know, he how, how is his support in in Gabon? Are are people? You know, he he came in in 2019 when you know Gabon missed out on qualifying for the Cup of Nations in Egypt, and he got to the Afcon this time, so he's done his job. But you know. It wasn't if it wasn't very impressive you know you came behind gambia uh, on goal difference in qualifying and then you know since had a I mean, you know a fairly mediocre you know world cup qualifying campaign where you know you weren't able to to compete with egypt um what is the sense in in gabon of you know the support for patrice for patrice is very it's very difficult to definitely to this this head coach because we know that this is their and he will play this second tournament in Africa Cup of Nations. The last was in 2006 in Egypt with the Connect uh, Guinea. And we, we, we can say that, and many, many journalists here say that he has not experienced because between the 2006 um, tournament in Egypt and now there is there is a uh, 15, 15, 15 years. And we know that the tournament has already changed because now in the past we play with 16 teams and now we are 20, 24 teams. And we want to know exactly what we can do for, for the national team because this is this second tournament. And uh, he has experience, this is a question. But we know that he had in experience as a, as a head coach in the, in the many clubs here in Africa, Ismailia or um, Oroya in, in, in Guinea. But for the national team, he has a head coach. Uh, he was a head coach of uh, the Republic Democratic of Congo. And there is no qualification for the, for the African Cup of Nations with the Leopards. But with the Gabon, this is the second tournament. He has the experience. We don't believe in it. And that's a great question. And this is a great question and a great interrogation for the, for about uh, about Patrice Never. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, very much so. Uh, you know, the, the expectations will, you know, be heavy on him. You know, I'm just looking at the squad, you know, 
when the selection came out, you know, obviously the big the big one was, you know, the absence of Didi and Dong. Can you tell me why why did pa, uh, Patrice, you know, leave him out of his squad? And, you know, was that received well by by the, the Federation and the, and the fans? The fans hope, yeah, <laughs> a bad reception by the fans because we know that the, the best player in the middle is Didi Dong. Didi Dong is the best player in the middle. We, we know that there is Poco, Lemina, Tonga, but the, the player box to box with great experience, with great experience in Didi Dong. And now uh, the absence of this player is very. Um, uh, we can the fans can understand that because we know that um, there is many problems with the with the player between the player and the coach. There is many problems the ball with the ball. But now this is a decision of the coach. He is the captain of the team. But now we the fans hope that the the head coach talk with the player to try to find um, in a to make a good decision for the for the players, but now there is no no player like Didi Dong in the middle. As um, we know, we have we have discovered um, Muketu. Muketu is a very great player, but Didi Dong has this experience. He has played for Sunderland. He has played for Watford. He has played for for many clubs in in, in Europe. But Muketu has not the experience. But let me know. Mm. It's very, uh, it's a great player, but um, physically, it's very, it's very hard to explain. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the pressure must be even more so on the coach after making such such a big decision. So, I mean, coming into the tournament, then you know, you've you've had some disruptions, but also you know, a good crop of players um, led by you know a fresh Alabama young, you know, isn't as tired as a lot of the other players coming from Europe. What are the expectations of of the team uh, at this tournament, what what do the the federation and the fans expect for the team? Well, we expect that we can. What can I do? What can I say? But now, um, for us, for the people, for the fans, for the governance people, uh, there is uh, no chances because now now this is an exclusive information. We uh, we get it now. Uh, the players are always. Are always in Dubai. They reclaim the, the money for the tournament. They reclaim it, but now uh, there is a there is a great problem for the national team. And now it's a, it's exclusive. They are they are always in Dubai, and they refuse to join the Cameroon to play because that there is no money, and we know that this is a, a great problem for the country now and. Uh, the 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 federation the the fans and the Gabonese people uh, are very sad for that for the, for that situation and we and we hope that the the players and the federation will uh, will find a solution to for that and enjoy Cameroon because we want to we want to win the cup in Cameroon out the Cameroon has won the cup here in 2016 and uh, now with the well now with the this problem is very hard to explain you exactly what the people um, what the people think about this team because that we know that now there is a, um, a problem with the team and the, and the fans because that the, the fans for a, for a, for example the players uh, uh, no meet the fans there is um, a great, uh, a, a great problem for that, because that the players, when they are here, they are always in the in the hotel, no meeting the people. It's very hard. But with that problem, what can what can we do? Nothing. Uh, so, so just to clarify, the players are they're in Dubai and they're currently refusing to fly out to Cameroon because of yeah. not being paid. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's that's huge news. Um, are, are and are you hopeful that that they'll be able to come to come to a decision? And and if they can't, what do you think will happen? But we don't know exactly what's what's happened now. We 
we get we get uh, the information by our reporters over there. They are tell they they are told us that uh, there is a um, there is a problem in Dubai, and we are um, and we are waiting for more information to be able to get on this people. That concludes our Group C preview pod. A big thanks to Amin, Gary, Boina, and John. And to you, listener, if you enjoyed listening to our podcast, hit us up on our social media platforms and please do leave us a review, OTW underscore podcast, and have a great day.